I, I've been looking forward to, uh, uh, to spending this time with you. Last week we were talking, I do not have a study guide for you tonight, we're just, we're just going to kind of chat. I'm talking about a very important topic though, if you were here last Wednesday night, you know we were talking about this, this concept that is called the, 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 the doctrine or the concept of original sin. Now, that doesn't mean the original sin, the, such as Lucifer's pride. It's talking about that uh, there's the, the, the vast, well, the majority of Christianity believes in a concept. It's been adopted by most of Christianity called original sin. And what that means is, in, in just everyday terms, is that human beings are born sinners. In other words, we, we're not sinners because of the things we've done, but we were born that way. I mean, from the time, you know, even before we were born, we were sinners passed down from Adam. Now, what is, where, does, where did Christianity get that? Well, that came along really about 300 A.D., and I won't get into history because, frankly, that's pretty boring talk. But let me just tell you where it came in. It came in from some scriptures. You know, like there's some scriptures that talk about that. For example, we looked at Psalm 51, verse 5. This beautiful psalm that David wrote. But, uh, but in this psalm where he was confessing his sins, he then said this, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. And we talked about that. I'm not going to rehash last week's uh, lesson, but it, it almost looks like he said, well, you know, it, you know I'm, I'm sinful. You know, I did what I did, God. I took, you know, I took Bathsheba to be my wife, even though she was somebody else's wife, and I killed him. And I know that was bad, but don't forget, God, that it was my mother's fault. <laughs> it was my mother that, that brought me into this world. And, and, she, and when she did, she, you know, I was born a sinner, so I can't really help. And that's not what, all, that's not what David believed, I don't believe. But, uh, uh, but, but this is a verse that kind of alludes to that. But the really bigger one is, uh, is actually found in the book of Romans, chapter number, 12, or chapter number 5, verse 12. And this is where it gets linked back, this concept where people say, well, see, we've inherited, we, we inherited sin, we inherited guilt, we inherited all this because of Adam. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world. Now that is talking about Adam, all right? So he's drawing a picture and pointing an arrow back to Adam. Whereas uh, by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men. So death passed upon all men. And this is where this, this uh, passage, uh, you know, and, and, and there are a few others, such as being, uh, you know, children of wrath and so on, where much of Christianity has adopted this concept that we call original sin, or some people refer to it as the depravity of man. In other words, we just simply are sinners because we were born human beings, and all, all human beings are that way. Now, uh, again, I said it's very, very common. The, the church then, that, that created some problems though. You know, when that was adopted, that created an issue like babies. You know, so if a baby is, is born a sinner, we know that God cannot allow sin in heaven. God can't let sinners in heaven, can he? No, he can't, according to the scriptures. So that creates a problem. Well, much of the, you know, the, the Catholic Church and, and many churches, you know, many denominations like that, they answered that problem with, by creating a concept called infant baptism. Now, the sad part is that's based on the flawed theology that baptism somehow saves somebody. I talked this Sunday, baptism can't save anybody. Baptism has nothing to do with salvation. But, there, but based on that belief that it can, they believe that baptizing babies into the church somehow saved that baby from its inherited death sentence. But, uh, you know, so, so that, you know, that's, that's, how, that's how much uh, of the you know, Christian world kind of responded to that. And then the evangelical community, which, you know, frankly, especially the fundamental side, really embraces this concept of the depravity of man. Basically, like, you know, we're just not capable of anything good. Man is innately horrible. You know, everybody's awful. And, you know, and it's this really negative view. Um, and, uh, and so responded with a concept, a made-up concept called the account, uh, uh, age of accountability. So you may have heard that in a church. You know, there's this age of accountability. Well, what's that age? Well, we don't know. Um, where's that in the Bible? Well, it's not. But, <laughs> but it's a thing. Just trust me. You know, it, it's kind of that sort of an idea. And, and, you know, we can kind of, kind of find some scriptures that allude to it. The problem is that, you know, these, the proponents of that are, are going to find some scriptures that support it. But there's also a lot of scriptures that sort of refute that. For example, Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 20. And I'm doing this really quickly, but I've got to get this foundation out here because we're going to move on from babies here in a minute. So God said this. He said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. 
So God's pretty clear. His plan does not include children being condemned to hell because of anything that their parents did. He said, the soul that sins, that soul shall die. It's, it's, on, it's on us. And so God is pretty clear about that. But, uh, but really the bigger issue, these are, this is, so, so this is, now we're going to kind of go a new direction here. The bigger issue is not even so much we could debate, you know, we could find, you know, if you wanted to have a debate about this, I would let you pick. If you want to come in next Wednesday night and debate this, you can pick whichever side you want. I'll take the other side because I know that whichever side I take, I can find scriptures to back it up. Okay. All I've got to do is dislocate them from their proper place or misuse them or, you know, you know, I can, I can twist them and massage them and, and frame it in such a way that, you know, I can put up an argument. The fact is, it's really not as, it's not as cut and dried as, as we often try to make things out to be within Christianity. But here's the bigger issue. The bigger issue is if we're going to believe that we're born sinners, again, as the majority of Christianity does, if we're going to believe that, that sort of is a finger pointing at God. There's a, there's a spiritual finger that we're pointing at God if we do that, and I'll show you why. Because... Uh, look at Ecclesiastes chapter uh, 12 and verse 7. So watch. Then shall the dust, this is, talking, this is Solomon's talking about the end of life and as a person dies. Then shall the dust, it's our bodies, return to the earth as it was, and the spirit shall do what? Shall return to God who gave it. Now notice very carefully. So if, if our spirit is going to return to God who gave that spirit to that body, then what we're saying is that our, the spirit of every child that's born was with God, and God put the spirit into that living body, yes? yes? So what does that say about God if he puts a spirit, you know, think about it this way. If we're going to believe that a human being is born depraved, if a human being is born depraved, as the scriptures we looked at last week, according to Paul, a sinful spirit has died, yes? That's a dead spirit. So are we saying that God put a dead spirit into a living body? I mean, if, if we're going to say that, you know, this concept of original sin, if we're going to say that, you know, a person is born a sinner, then we're saying that God took a flawed, sinful spirit and put it into a living body. Now, does that, does that sit okay with you? No. Does that jibe with everything else we know about the nature of God? No, that's kind of in contrast to that, you know, and, and so, so we have to be very, very careful here. So, so let's go back. Let's go back to Romans chapter 5, and let's take that verse that we just looked at just a minute ago, and I want you to notice, wherefore, as by, as by one man sin entered into the world, and that's true, and death by sin, and that's also true, and so death passed upon all men, that's also true. Now watch carefully, for that all have sinned, that's also true. So why is it that Death has passed upon all men. Well, notice it, it doesn't say that guilt has passed upon all men. It says death has passed upon all men. First, firstly. So consider this. You know, I, here's, here's part of the problem that many of us have. I have had this, I have this problem myself. I do this many times with scriptures. Sometimes when we want a verse to say something, we just simply substitute words or thoughts. And so we'll read this and we'll say, and so guilt passed upon all men. <laughs> for that all have sinned. You know, so doom passed upon... No, it says, so death has passed upon all men. Now I ask you a question. Do human beings die? Yes or no? Yes. Sure they have. That's, that's the result of what happened with what Adam did. Death passed upon all men. But it also clearly says that all have sinned, and that's the reason. That's the reason. We're, all, we're sinners because we have sinned, not because God put a defective spirit into a body. Do you follow me? Yeah. So we need to be very careful about allowing traditions or our thoughts or our opinions to sort of sneak into this. So, so with that in mind now, now we, let's continue reading because notice what verse 13 says. Now, now Paul begins to help us to understand the, what we're really talking about here. And I know we read this last week, but this is gonna, what we're going to build on here. For until the law, sin was in the world. All right, so sin was in the world after Adam, yes? Sin was in the world during Noah's day, yes? During Abraham's day. 
The law came when? The law came almost 2,000 years after Adam. The law was given to Moses to give to God's people. So there was still sin in the world, but watch what he says here. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. So what does the word imputed mean? The word imputed means it, it's not applied. So, so he's saying that, you know, yes, there was sin in the world. Yes, there, you know, Abraham was a sinner just like everybody else. But, but he, and, and, and so were the people alive in those days. But God is drawing a distinction here. He says, unless there's a law in place, then sin doesn't count. How many, how many of you are parents in the room? You're a parent. Did you ever punish your children for breaking a rule that you did not first tell them what the rule was? Don't raise your hand. If you did, don't tell me. <laughs> Bad question. Don't tell me. We don't do that. Parents don't punish children for breaking rules that the child never knew was a rule. You know, school teachers, you know, school, back in the days when they actually, you know, disciplined kids and, 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 you know, punish kids for anything, in those days, principals and teachers, they didn't punish children for, you know, for, dis for breaking school rules when the child didn't first know what the rules were. You follow me? Now, isn't God so much more of a just God than any school principal and any parent ever thought about being? So, so this is what God is saying. So sin is not automatically applied unless there's a knowledge of the law, unless there's a knowledge of right and wrong. Now, that helps us with infants and children. We kind of finished there last week. That helps us with that, but we, we then kind of wanted to expand this, this topic and try to understand a much harder question. I, I don't think any of us believe that, you know, a, a, a baby that can't even, can't even form moral thoughts yet, you know, a, a newborn baby, you know, barely is aware of its, even, its own existence, you know, we think, um, you know, and, and so forth. So certainly not to the level of making conscious choices of morality. But what about, hum what about adults? You know, what about these, you know, the stereotypical example is, what about, you know, what about Tarzan? <laughs> right? Tarzan's abandoned on an island by himself. He's raised by animals. There's no human beings there. You know, his mom and dad are, you know, the, so what, what happens with somebody like that? What if somebody is, is you know, as a baby is, 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 you know, somehow left alone, grows up in isolation, never meets another human being, and dies? But what happens to him? What happens to her? Or a young girl in Iran who never hears anything other than Islam teachings, you know, and, and, and never hears, never hear, you know, the only time that Jesus has ever spoken about it is an incredibly, it's, it, it's called a, you know, heretical teaching, you know, and, and you know, and, and can be accompanied by death, you know, if you, if you, you know, you subscribe to that. All. What about that little girl? You know, what happens with somebody like that? Is that not a much harder concept to deal with? But we don't want to run from that. So, so let's let God kind of help us with that. Again, you know, now I could ask your opinions, you know, and I do want you to be able to share your opinions, but I need to do the teaching first so that when it goes on YouTube, that's what gets played because once we all start talking with each other, the, the tape has to go off because nothing, nothing makes sense to the people watching. So let me do the teaching first. But if I did, if I asked for opinions, you know, you know we could get 70 opinions. Everybody, we've all kind of come up with certain traditions, you know, we've all, whether you were born and reared in church or whether you were, you know, new to church, we all still have a, a, a past, a, a life that sort of shapes our thoughts and our perspectives. So we all have a lot of opinions about this, but the question is not so much what is our opinion, uh, the question is, you know, what, what does the Bible say? What does the text tell us? And that's kind of where we need to, to go. So, so here's the kind of, there's two thoughts. There's two thoughts prevalent within Christianity. Let me just quickly tell you what they are and why those two thoughts are out there. Uh, as, as to what happens to someone, an adult, who never hears about Jesus. We as New Testament Christians believe that it is the name of Jesus that saves, yes? It's the blood of Christ that saves, yes? We are part of God's family if we put our trust and faith in Jesus Christ. Yeah. All right, so that is what we believe, and there's a multitude of scriptures that tells us that is exactly the truth. So what about people who have never heard of Jesus? 
What about somebody who has never been told that there was a son of God who came to earth, lived a perfect life, died on the cross to pay for their sins? I mean, it's hard enough for us to fathom that he would do that. But somebody who's never heard of it, you know, they certainly cannot put their faith in him, can they? So, so, this, so here's, the two, here's the two thoughts about what happens there. The first thought is this, and that is that God will not hold anyone accountable if they've never heard. So part of Christianity would say, you know what, I refuse to believe that God would hold somebody accountable from a, for eternity of all things if they've never heard. Now, where would they get a thought like that? Where would they get that? What would they base that on? Well, let's go to Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse number 13. Notice, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, this is what we call an affirmative statement. In other words, this tells us who will be saved, yes? Anyone who calls on Jesus, expressing their faith in Him, will be saved. No exceptions. Is that correct? Doesn't matter what their past is, doesn't matter the color of the skin, male, female, old, young, it doesn't make any difference. God is not a respecter of persons, and that's also in this uh, book also, and so forth. That's what we believe. And so, uh, but, but, this, but although this tells us definitely who will be saved, it does not say that whosoever does not call on the name of the Lord shall not be saved. Do you follow me? It's not a negative. There's no negative statement here. This is simply a positive statement about who will be saved. So we, we look then at the next verse, verse number 14, and notice what Paul is teaching here. He says, now, so if they call on Jesus, they'll be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? So we work our way backward through this verse. So if they've never heard of Jesus, they can't believe in him. If they don't believe in him, then they can't call on him. And if they don't call on him, then they're not saved. You, you follow me? Yeah. So Paul is showing us here, this is not that simple. He's acknowledging the fact that there are people who will never hear. They will not have a, a missionary come to their village. They will not hear... They may not be mentally able to even understand. There's a portion of our community and our world that their minds, there was something happened genetically with them, and they cannot understand. They can't comprehend. And so, so it is what he's talking about. So he said, look, if, if they've never heard, they can't believe. And if they don't believe, then they can't call on him. If they can't call on him, then they're not going to be saved. So Paul is, so this is, the, this is a, the, <clears throat> among many others, but this is an example of those who would say, see right there. God is not going to hold somebody accountable if they've never heard. That's what Paul is teaching us here. Now, the other side. The other side, and, and, and this, would be, this would be probably, um, you know, the, the side maybe uh, what we might call more liberal type Christianity. The other side would be much more fundamental, evangelicals. Evangelicals kind of, for the most part, most evangelical Christians would take the other approach, which is simply this. No one's excused. No one's excused. Now, that sounds harsh, but here's, here's, here's why they would say that. There's no, they don't, they're not excused. Uh, Romans chapter 2. We're going to stay mostly in Romans tonight. It's a very doctrinal book. Romans chapter 2 and verse 12. For as, as many has... Watch what he says here. He says, for as many as have sinned without the law. All right? That would be Gentiles. That would be people who have never heard Jesus. That would be people who have never been given a Bible. They've never had a missionary come. They've never had anybody witness to them. They've never heard as many as have, have sinned without the law shall perish without the law. The word perish means to be destroyed. As many as have sinned in the law, so that would be the Jews, that would be those who have been told the truth, those who have access to the scriptures and know right from wrong. As many as have sinned in the law shall be judged by the law. So we have this verse that it's like, well, now what do we do? <laughs> we kind of did this last week, didn't we? See, things are not so cut and dried as most people think. That's why we're supposed to study. We're supposed to work at this. And, uh, and look at verse 14. Let's continue on. Look at verse 14. For when the Gentiles, now I get specific, when the Gentiles, which have not the law, all right, the Gentiles did not have the law of God, the Torah, and so forth, do by nature, we talked about nature last week, do by nature the things contained in the law, 
In other words, their nature, something inside of them, their conscience, tells them you're not supposed to kill. All right? The law says thou shalt not kill, and they don't have that law. They've not got it written down, but somehow they, well, I know I'm not supposed to do that. Something inside of them tells them. He said, so the Gentiles that do not have the law do by nature the things contained in the law. These, having not the law, are a law unto themselves. So now we feel like we've swung the other way, right? So this is where, now again, I'm not telling you, and, you know, I'm, not, I'm not telling you what to think right now. What I'm, what I'm showing you is these are the kinds of scriptures that people will use and say, well, see right there, you know, nobody's, nobody. So this guy out in some remote tribe in Papua New Guinea who's never heard anything about it, well, his tribe probably has rules, you know? The aborigines in, in, you know, the outback of Australia, they may never have never heard of Jesus. They may have never seen a Bible. They may have never heard John 3, 16. They don't know any of that stuff, but they have rules within their culture. So where did that sense of right and wrong come from? See, then they would say that they're obeying the laws of the law. Of the law. They're obeying the commandments of the law. They just don't know that's where they came from. But there's something inside of them, and we'll continue on with that. Look at verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness... And their thoughts, the meanwhile, accusing or else excusing. We'll come back to that. But notice, their conscience also bearing witness. So now we have these passages that, that you know, this is where someone, and, you know, there's others. The heavens declare the glories of God and so forth. You know, people, they say everybody, you know, everybody, uh, everybody knows that there's a God. Now, so what do we make of this? So which one's right? Which one's right? The, the people who say, well, you know, no excuse. You know, you're born a sinner, or at least, you know, your very first sin, boy, you're doomed right there. You know, it doesn't make any difference whether you have a Bible. doesn't make any difference if everybody taught you right. doesn't make any difference if you really understand right from wrong. doesn't make any because Because God has put inside of everyone a witness, a law. It almost sounds like if you do anything right, you're in trouble. <laughs> right? I mean, if you do anything right, if you obey any of those laws... Well, you've blown it. <laughs> You're in trouble. Now, we come to this point, and we've, we're so, I think we get so focused then on, we try to look at examples, and we try to think, well, okay, but what if, I mean, I don't think God's going to send a baby. I don't think God's going to take a man that's never hurt. I don't think that God would do I just don't think, I don't think, I don't think. Let's stop for a minute. Let's, let's back up and kind of, instead of looking at sins and laws and whether or not somebody has a Bible, let's, let's talk about God. Let's go back and talk about God. What do we know about God? What do we know about, you know, what does God say about himself? You know, and, and, and you know, is, can, can we put everything about God into a box here or into a box here? You know, can we, can we say definitively? So let's, let's kind of take a look at something that Jesus had to say. And Jesus is going to teach us you know, Jesus is in that intertestamental period, you know, kind of in between the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Gospels are still Old Testament mostly. You know, they're telling the story of Jesus was talking to Jews and he was talking about works and he was talking about all those things. But he was preparing for the future, wasn't he? He was, he was always hinting at a future. And he was hinting oftentimes about the real nature of God. The laws, you know, we can so focus on laws maybe to the point where we think that describes God and we get the idea maybe that all those rules are what God is really all about. And, and that's kind of the world's impression, isn't it? Yeah. Have you grown up trying to talk to people about the Bible or about church or about God and their, their opinion is or their thought is, well, it's all these thou shalt nots and thou shalt do this and do, you know, and you can't do anything, you know, and they think that you can't do anything because you're a Christian now. You can't do anything fun. <laughs> Right? Yeah. You know, take all the fun out of life and you're a Christian. <laughs> well, it's not like that. No. It's not like that. So, so let's look at a parable Jesus taught. Jesus was talking one day 
And in Luke chapter number 12, he was, you know, he was, he was speaking uh, to, um, you know, to a group. And in, in the later part of that, of that passage, you know, he was, he was really talking about a, a master who gave his servant some responsibility and then he left. And this is actually several parables. He talks several similar parables. But in this particular case, this servant thought, you know what, he's not coming back anytime soon. So I'll just live any way I want to. And he mistreated the others, and he, he, wasn't a good, uh, he wasn't a good servant. He didn't do what his master said. And the master came back unexpectedly. And, <clears throat> and here we pick up the reading in verse number 47. Here we go. Verse number 47. And that servant, which knew his Lord's will. Now remember, what we've been talking about is people who have the law, people who know better, people who know what God wants, people who God has been clear with. They've grown up in a, in, they were either Jews growing up and were taught the law, or they were, they, like many of us, you grew up in a Christian home and your mom and dad taught you right from wrong, and they taught you morals, and grandma sat you down one day, and, you know, and so forth. Here we go. And that servant which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten... With many stripes. Now, again, get past the whole, well, you, you know, the whole image there that isn't real popular in, in today's culture. But he's saying, look, this servant is going to get beaten. He's not going to be any mercy. This master is not going to show him any mercy. Why? Because he knew his Lord's will. Yes? yes? This is not somebody that the master didn't leave with a bunch of rules in his pocket and forget to give it to him. He told him very clearly, this is what I command you to do. He was very clear about it. The servant chose to disregard the law. And he's going to be beaten with many stripes. And then he said this in verse 48. So then he goes on. He said, but he that knew not, right? So someone maybe that wasn't given the rules, maybe it was up to that servant was supposed to teach the others and he didn't do it. But he that knew not did commit things worthy of stripes. In other words, he did the same things that this servant did. All right? He, 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 was, he, he did all the same sins, all the same, he broke all the same commandments. He was just as bad, if you will, as the servant who knew better, but he wasn't given the law. Watch what Jesus said. He shall be beaten with few stripes. So now we're even more confused, aren't we? Because we see that God does not see people as the same. God doesn't judge people the same. He said, you knew better, you're getting a big whooping. <laughs> but he didn't know better. But he's still going to get a whooping. It's just not going to be anything like his. And so now we have this, this thing. Now, let's be careful and not try to relate this to salvation or to degrees of hell, although that's not necessarily what it, it's not necessarily wrong. But, but let's be careful. He's laying down a principle here. The principle that Jesus is teaching is the same thing we've been studying. He's saying there is a difference between people who know better and choosing to ignore the law and people who don't know better, people who have not been given that much information. Let's be honest. We live in a world of varying degrees of access to God. Do we not? You know, let's be very careful. In fact, Paul, we're going to read a scripture here in a minute. We're not going to read the actual verse, but there's a, there's a verse we're going to read that, that right before it, Paul says, you be careful not to think too highly of yourself. Don't think too highly of yourself. You know, how many of you were born to Christian parents? Raise your hand. You grew up in a godly home? Parents taught you right. Yeah. You've, you've got a pretty crystal clear picture of the law, don't you? I got a very crystal clear picture of the law at the end of a willow switch from my mother. I knew exactly what was right and what was wrong. No doubt in my mind, no question in my mind. There was never a thing I did as a child that I wasn't sure, is this okay or not? Everything I did. Well, no, I didn't get it easy because I did a lot of things wrong. <laughs> And my mother always knew. She made me, well, she made me cut my own switch. You may have you make, your parents make you cut your own switch. What a quandary that is. I mean, that's worse. That's worse than the beating. Because you're like, I got to get a good one, but I don't want it to be too good. If it's not good enough, she's going to go get one. I know that'll be bad. I mean, you wouldn't, use a, you wouldn't use the one she'll get on a horse. So, you know, 
But see, we, many of us were taught. We came up knowing what the law was. Now, God is giving a message to us that we're accountable for that. You're accountable for that. Don't, don't you even think about comparing yourself to some heathen somewhere who's, you know, uh, you know, worshiping a voodoo doctor because that's all he knows. God says, don't you dare think you're any more righteous than he is. He's doing what he knows. You didn't even do all that you knew. So we got to be very careful. See, this is, this is what Jesus is trying to teach us. He's trying to teach us, don't try to box me in. Don't try to box God in thinking that you're okay because you've kept some of the law. No, don't think you're better than somebody else because you weren't, you didn't have sex before you got married. Well, doesn't that make me better than anybody else? No. You telling me you were completely sexually pure? I don't think so. Never had a bad thought, never had a, come on. So we've got to be careful about that. So he's laying down a principle here. Now, I've got to hurry here. So we, we, we have this, this, you know, this verse, and he's, he's, he's telling us not everything's the same. That also applies then to how much we were given in terms of faith. Watch carefully now. Watch, uh, let's go back to the book of Romans. Verse number, uh, chapter 1 and verse number 17. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith. Now, there's an allusion here to from Judaism to Christianity, from Jew to Gentile. There's, there's, some, there's a foundation for that in the prior verses. But, but let's also be aware, and we're going to see the scriptures about it in a minute, not everybody has been given the same amount of starting faith. That's just what I'm going to call it. The same amount of starting faith. Right. You know, you, you, you know, what did you get as, as seed faith? <laughs> well, let's take a look at that scripture. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men. Equally? No. Look at who the righteous, look at who the wrath of God is directed at. Those who who, um, who against all ungodliness and righteousness of men who hold the truth. You got a Bible with you tonight? You got a Bible with you tonight? You're holding the truth. Now, we can hold that in righteousness by doing it, or we can still be holding it but doing it in unrighteousness. Who is God severely ticked at. The ones who hold the truth and still behave unrighteously. God is not pouring out His wrath on those who don't know the truth. He's not pouring out His wrath on them. He's not furious with them. He is, however, His wrath is directed at those of us that have the truth. Now again, my question then is, what was your starting point? What was my starting point? What are Americans starting point? You know there's more Bibles in America than there are people. There are way more Bibles in America than there are people. Way more. Like I think it's three times as many. So there's a billion Bibles in America at least. And and I guess with the internet, you know, with digital, well, I mean it's, you know, it's unlimited. So so um so who's God's wrath against? Well, it's against those who hold the, the truth and unbelief. We're not done yet, so let's continue on. Those who have the truth but choose unrighteousness, that's who God is really pouring His wrath out against. Now, Jesus is saying then that God holds people accountable based on how much of the truth they have. And now I want to show you also how much faith He gave them to start with. You ever heard of simple childlike faith? We talk about that, right? You know, children believe almost anything. And you know what's required of a child to be saved? Just believe that Jesus died on the cross, paid for your sins, and He wants you in heaven. You believe that, you're saved. Right? But it gets a little more complicated with those who have so much more knowledge. 
See, children don't have the knowledge of, you know, they don't understand words like justification and sanctification and iniquity and transgressions and all that. All they know is, yeah, I did some bad stuff, and if God, if He'll forgive me, I want it. And that's good enough for God. Yes. Because that's all they started with. Now, um, that being said, what about these people then who never hear anything? Let's go back to Romans chapter 2. And notice verse number 14. I've got I to gotta really hurry here. So, you know, uh, uh, Romans chapter 2 and verse number uh, 14. So, so what about these people that never, never hear anything? Here we go. For when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, these having not the law are a law unto themselves. I, I you know, so we, we have this, 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 well, let's look at verse 15 also. I've got to remind you of what it said there. This is verse 15. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts. So their conscience also bearing witness. So here's what God is saying. God is saying, He has not left anybody without something. Everybody has a conscience. Everybody has a conscience. But conscience is partly what God has placed within them, but conscience is also something that is nurtured, is it not? Parents try to nurture conscience within a child. You know, I... I um, but there's also this thing of, of faith and, and, and how much faith someone has. I, I did not put it in the, in the text. Let me read for you uh, Romans, chapter, uh, Romans chapter number um, Romans chapter 12. But God has, but, but, uh, uh, but let, let no one, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God. You remember that verse we, ta- you know, we, we read often, be not conformed to this world, be transformed by the ring of your mind, so forth. Then he says this, for, why, for I say, through the grace given unto me, to every man that is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think soberly, watch, according as God has dealt, and that word dealt, it means exactly what it sounds like. It's a card term. You deal cards, right? You get these, you get these, you get these, you get these. As God has dealt to every man the measure of faith. So God says, I'm going to measure out some faith. This is what you get to start with. That's what you start with. So you started with this much. God measured it out. He gave you what he wanted you to have. Then he measured some out for Dana. Probably not the same as yours. Measured some out for her, could be more, could be less. And measure some out for Danny. Could be more, could be less, doesn't make any difference. None of us know what everybody started. This is what I was talking about. What is your starting faith? Were you born in a Christian home? Were you reared in a church? Did you hear good preaching? Did you hear good teaching? Did your parents make sure you had a Bible? That at least you had the opportunity to read it? Were you, were you, rare, were you in a Christian school? Well, look, you were in America, so that's a pretty good... You're, I'd like to say that's a great start, which it is, because you are in America, but that also means that we're more accountable, right? Because he said, to whom much is given. I didn't read that verse. I, 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 I forgot to read that earlier verse. I didn't, didn't get to it, where, where he was talking about to, uh, back in Luke. He said, to whom much is given, much is required. Much is required. Now, what does he mean? If I started you off in a Christian home and I gave you so many people in your life and I gave you so many instances where you knew, you knew what I wanted, you know what I want, you know the scriptures, you at least have the moral start that most people don't have, guess what? Here's your expectations. Hers might be down here. And God is not so much concerned about you comparing yourself to her or you comparing yourself to him or him, her, her, or anybody else. He said... What did you start with? And those that he gave much to and did not do much with it, are going to be beaten with many stripes, symbolically. On the other hand, this tribal guy, this aborigine, this Iranian girl, whatever it is, all they have to work from is maybe that little part inside of them. This is where we come, you're, I know you're waiting for me to give you a final answer, right? <laughs> they going to heaven or not? <laughs> Do you trust God to be fair? Yes. Do you trust God to be just? Yes. I cannot and no one can tell you. 
everything about how God judges this world or judges people. Nobody can do that. Look, do you realize if God had said, somebody, and I know, I'm, I know we're out of time, but bear with me for, give me three more minutes. If, if God had been crystal clear about everything in Scripture, consider this. What if God, if Herman, if God had told us, no, you know, uh, you know, uh, you, well, you know I, I'm, I'm going to give a free pass to anybody who hasn't heard the name Jesus. Okay, I'm just going to let them come into heaven, you know, don't... If God said, I'm going to give a free pass to everybody who has never heard the name Jesus, do you know what the logical thing to do would be? Don't tell, tell exactly. Don't tell them. Don't tell them. Don't send missionaries. Don't witness to anybody. Don't send anybody overseas. Let them just live out their lives and let them go to heaven. Because if you tell them and they reject him, well, now they're doomed. So God's not going to tell us that even if it were true. It's not true. Even if it were true, God's not going to tell us that. By the same token, if he said, hey, nope, nobody gets an excuse. You know what? If they never, if they don't, if you don't sit, and I've, I've been in missions conferences where idiotic pastors like me get up and say, well, if we don't send somebody to tell them they're going to die and go to hell. You don't know that, you idiot. Because if God said that in Scripture... You know, if God said, look, I've already determined, look, that's basically saying God's already determined who's going to heaven and who's going to hell. That's basically what that's saying. It's God's fault for putting a broken, dead spirit in a man that he knew was going to live on an island all by himself and never hear the name Jesus. That's God's fault. Boy, I'd be real careful. I didn't say, that's not what I meant. You know that, right? <laughs> I'm glad God knows all things. I mean, but I mean, that's what we would be saying if we said that. If we say, "Look, I, I know for a fact that God's going to send them to hell," and you know, and, and and can I remind you that God said, "Take heed where you stand, lest you fall." Are you are you with me? So we get to the point in this where we just have to simply say, "I trust God." Amen. I trust God. You know, the, it, it, go back to Romans chapter 2 real super quickly. I know I said three minutes, and I'm, I'm sorry, but let me, let me just do this, please. If you need to leave, please go. feel free to go do so. Nobody's going to judge you except for me. D uh, Romans, chapter, <laughs> Rom Romans chapter 2, <laughs> verse number 14. You know, you know, for the Gentiles don't have the law and so forth. Now look at verse number 15, and this is the part we didn't read earlier. Which show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and their thoughts the meanwhile. Now watch. Accusing or else excusing. Do you see there's language there that allows God to be God? It allows God to be God. You know, only God can tell whether that Down syndrome child understands what he's hearing. God's the only one who knows that. He's the only one who knows that. I trust God to be fair. I trust God to be righteous. I trust God to be good. I trust God to be merciful. God loves mercy. God doesn't want anybody to perish. So God is capable of doing what we cannot do, which is to distinguish how much faith you started with, how much did you hear in life, how much opportunity did you have, and this is what I'm going to hold you accountable for. I'm going to hold you accountable for what you know for what you've been told. So a little bit of hope there maybe for, for some that, that are, you know, are not sure. You know what you never... I'll save that. I was going to ask you, do you know what you'll never find anywhere in the Bible? I'm done, but do you know what you'll never find in the Bible? Ever? You will not find one atheist in the Bible. You'll not find one atheist. Everybody had a God. Everybody has a God. From the beginning, it's always been about whether or not we align ourselves with him or with one of these other gods we talked about for eight months. That's what it's always been about. And that's what it's still about. If you align yourself with God, we can trust him to do the right thing.